Welcome to Invisible Tears. I'm Amanda, one of the co-hosts of Invisible Tears. Today, I'm here with Drew, one of the other co-hosts as well. How are you doing, Drew? Doing pretty good. How are you doing today? Doing good, thanks. So unfortunately, we don't have Jane today, but it's because Jane's on vacation. So no worries. Jane will be back next episode, guys. But we are so excited to be back on with our friends from Light the Way, Shana and Tate. How are you guys doing today? Doing We're great. doing well. Thanks Thank for having you. us. Thank you guys so much for taking the time and jumping back on. Um, after the first episode we did with you guys, we definitely said we were like, okay, we're, we're going to have you guys on to start reviewing all the casework, you know, and all the cases that you're doing, putting more eyes on all the amazing work that you guys are doing because you guys are such amazing advocates, I think is really important. So today, you guys have brought us a case that we're going to go ahead and review on Lenine Ray Rogers. She's a missing person. So I don't know if you guys want to give us a, an overview of her case. Sure. So um, first of all, thanks for having us back. We appreciate of all of the work that you guys do in this community. And we appreciate the opportunity to talk about all of these missing people and the families that are missing them. Um, so Lenine Rogers has been missing since January 7th, 1981 from a small little town called Hayward Township, Pennsylvania. Um, and we work directly with Lenine's daughter. And Lenine is also known as Lonnie. So if you hear Tate's or I say Lonnie, that is Lenine. We work with her daughter, Allison Diker, who is a fearless advocate for her mother. And we'll talk about um, how Allison wrote a book um, during the pandemic about her mom and kind of their journey um, together. Allison lost her mom when she was five years old. So she essentially grew up without a mother, but has been searching for her mother since she was a really young child. So she's an, ama an amazing, amazing woman. Um, so I'm going to back up and just kind of give you an overview of um, who Lonnie was. So Lonnie was born profoundly deaf. She used sign language to communicate, but she was born into a family that really um, inspired her to still do everything. She was inspired to be a dancer, which she loved to do with her father. Um, they tell some really great stories about her and her father doing ballroom dancing together, which is just really cool when you think about the inability to hear music, but really to still enjoy it as and dance to it. Um, and she was encouraged to go to a regular school and to be part of everything that that was going on in the school. Her parents really encouraged her to do everything that she wanted to do. And so Lonnie graduated from high school. She was part of a deaf community. They have these um, social clubs for the deaf community where that they can go and socialize. And there she met a young man named Clinton Bud who will refer to him as Bud Rogers. And he was also deaf, but he was not born deaf. He became deaf when he was around three years old from an injury. And um, she fell in love with him um, and they got married short, shortly after. What she didn't know about Bud is that he kind of had an extensive criminal history. And so Lenine and Bud got married and they had two children together, Allison and Aaron. And there's about two years difference in age between the two of them. Lonnie and um, Bud were together for for a while when Allison was about five years old. You know, things I think were rocky along the way. But when Allison was about five years old is when uh, Lonnie decided that she no longer wanted to be with Bud. Um, we know that there was a Thanksgiving trip in 1980 where Lonnie took the two children um, to her family for Thanksgiving and she did not bring Bud with her. And she told her family that she was going to be leaving him and that he was going to be moving out of the house. So she tells her sister who lives in Ohio this, her sister's name is Glenny, and, um, you know, her family is supportive of this, but she does let her family know that just to give her children the ability to have a relationship with her father, she has told him that he can come and spend the Christmas holidays at the, um, the house where that they were living. And they lived kind of in um, a two family house. Mm -hmm. Um, so she said he can come and spend the holidays with them for Christmas. Um, so they were in, estranged in the fact that they weren't living together, but she was going to be allowing him to come back. So Christmas 1980 comes around and he's allowed to come back to the house. 
shortly after Christmas, she's like, okay, time for you to leave. And Bud refuses. And he's a very um, stubborn, kind of aggressive type man. And he's refusing to leave. So Lonnie doesn't really know what to do. She's very close to her parents and her grandparents who live not far from her house. She is working at a hotel cleaning rooms kind of to make ends meet at this point. She had met a man that she was kind of um, dating. He was not deaf. Um, She was kind of excited about this relationship. Um, She was excited to be getting away from Bud. On the 6th of January, she picks up her kids from the babysitter and she goes to see her father. His name is Ray. And she tells him that Bud is refusing to leave. Um, She needs help to kind of get out of the situation. He says, of course, we'll help you. He says, I only have $60 cash on me right now. Here, take this $60. And then she says, I'm going home to tell Bud I'm leaving him. You know, I'm going to, I'm going to leave the apartment. Mm -hmm. So that was January 6th, the night before she was last seen. And, um, there happens to be in the Pennsylvania snow belt and there is a giant blizzard that comes through. Bud claims that around 1245 in the middle of the night, uh, was the last time that he saw Lonnie after a big explosive fight between the two of them. Mm-hmm. He says they had an argument and that he went to sleep. Um, he says he woke, he wakes up around two or three in the morning and he realizes that she's not there because he had gone to sleep on the couch. Um, he notices that her car is still at the house. Her boots are still at the house. Her jacket's still there, her glasses, and even her hearing aids. And she needed her hearing aids. Like what, what deaf person that uses hearing aids would leave something that they essentially rely on to communicate with the world would leave their hearing aids. He says that he just woke up and thought, oh, she ran off with this other man, which anyone who knew Lonnie knew that she would never leave her two love, love children. She, you know, these are her babies. She would never leave right. them with Bud or in any situation. Mm-hmm. He then wakes up his two children who are five and three in the middle of the night. And as we all know, you do not wake sleeping babies like never. ever, ever. He gets them dressed. And he brings them to the babysitter, who also happens to be a deaf woman, a deaf woman at 3 a.m. And he says to the babysitter, now this is also a blizzard too. So like, imagine the conditions of this. I have to go find Lonnie. She's disappeared. I need to go out and find her. She's gone. And so this doesn't really sit right with the babysitter. We know that at some point he goes home and he makes all the beds and he does all of the dishes. So he says he's going to go find her, but he then goes home and he cleans all the dishes. He makes the beds. And we know from talking with people that knew, Bud, he was kind of like chauvinistic. Like he expected dinner on the table, beds made house clean. Like he was not doing any of the chores. Mm -hmm. So that was very strange to anyone who went to the house after, like, why would he go and clean the house up immediately when he was supposed to be looking for Lonnie? Right. Uh, he did have a job that started at 6 a.m., a, a shift at um, a, fa- a factory, I believe. You know, he was an early riser to get up and go to work, but to leave at 3 a.m., you know, is not was not normal. He's apparently goes out and looks for her. We don't really know what type of searching he did. And at 6 a.m., he says, well, I can't find her. And he just goes to work, never calls the police, never calls her family, and he does nothing. So the babysitter who has a daughter who is hearing, nothing is sitting right with her. She's just kind of out of her mind with like, this, something's not right. She says to her hearing daughter, you have to call her parents and tell her what what's happened. So her daughter calls Lonnie's parents and tells him, tells them what has happened. And the parents are beside themselves. They know that, you know, Lonnie was going to tell him she was leaving. They, they are very concerned and they report it to the police immediately. Um, The babysitter also does report to the police when they talk to her later that when, when Bud dropped the children off, that he was like sweaty, he was nervous. Um, You know, there were just some signs that he was just not all together. So both the parents then rush over to Lonnie's apartment and Lonnie's father kicks down the door Mm. um, because he he wants to know what has happened. And he is also shocked to find the apartment spotless. 
you know, the beds made, the, you know, the dishes done. Like, when did he have time to do that? Right. He calls the police. The police arrive. They also note that the hearing aids are still there. Her purse is still there. Her glasses. She had a Mustang. Her car is still there. Her car keys. Like where, where could this woman be without all of her, all of the things that she would need? They also notice that a king size pink blanket that it was in the household is missing and it can't be located. And it was a king size blanket. So it was rather large, something that you would notice was gone and bud cannot account for this so bud comes home he's like why are people in my house and he uh voluntarily is agrees to like a body search this is where allison always says this is kind of one of those things that has always made her think that her father had something to do with what happened to her mother when he's being voluntarily searched his wallet is searched when his wallet is open they find $60. And when he's asked, where did the $60 come from? Bud says, Lonnie gave it to me. And Ray, her father says, there's no way Lonnie gave that to you because Mm -hmm. Lonnie was trying to get away from you. So for Allison, she truly believes that was kind of like the aha moment for her that her Mm -hmm. father had something to do with the disappearances with her mother. So there are some initial searches done for um, Lonnie. And, you know, when I think of blizzard conditions, I'm thinking, you know, it must have been really difficult Mm -hmm. to look for someone, you know, even, you know, how do you look for footprints if it was continuing to snow, that type of things. But there were some initial searches. And Lonnie's family has said, has told Allison that one of the strangest things was, is while those searches were going on, that they all watched Bud stand in the window and just watch people searching. And he never assisted or helped or, you know, came outside to look. He just watched from a window. And that was really disturbing to them as concerned family members. Wow. So- That um, was kind of the disappearance of Lonnie. And really, she's been missing for 43 years with some tips coming in, but not a lot. Um, Allison has been able to do some cadaver dog searches from small tips that have come in. Um, But there's a bit more to Allison's story. For the next eight years after that was in and out of foster care, in and out of relatives' homes, and then in and out of Bud's care. And Bud was very abusive, um, neglectful, just really not a good parent. And he made her know known that he didn't like her. He re- She reminded him of her mother. So when she was about 14 years old, it was her brother's birthday and they were going going to another town. I believe it was to go out to dinner. He made her ride in like the back of the truck with no top on it. And it was in the late fall. She, she said it was freezing cold out. She was like banging on the window to be like, let me sit in the car. And Bud pulls into a police station. And of course, she acted as an interpreter for her father because he couldn't he couldn't talk. So she was the interpreter. She signed for him. So they pull into a police station and he get he makes her come in and he signs like you take her. And so she has to tell the police, essentially, he's leaving her there. He's not taking her. You deal with her. So he dropped this 14-year-old little girl at the police station and wanted nothing to do with her. And the police are like, well, we, we don't, you can't do this, sir. Like, yeah, you can't just do this. Like, we can call social services. And he was like, absolutely not. I'm not taking her, I'm leaving her here. Oh my God. Isn't that awful? Like it That's is horrifying. He's and this is the horrible person that he is. And so by miracle and lucky chance. Allison had ended up in the same school district that she had been previously. And she had this wonderful guidance counselor who had kind of like checked in with her because like she knew she had had a hard life. And this woman, like in a a couple weeks prior, a couple days prior had said, Hey, if you ever need anything, like here's my number and given Allison her number. And the police officer said, is there anyone you can call? And first Allison had said, yeah, you can call my aunt. And it was Bud's sister. And Bud's sister was like, no, you tell my brother he has to deal with this. So they called the sister, you know, nothing. 
And then Alice and the police officer was like, is there anyone else you can call? And she like by chance feels the paper in her pocket. And she's like, well, I guess you can call my guidance counselor. And by this incredible luck and truly fate, this guidance counselor ended up really adopting her. And she ended up being raised by this family and they are kind of who she considers to be her, her parents. And Mm -hmm. Allison is a kindergarten teacher Mm -hmm. and she has this heart of gold and she has her own children that she's an incredible mother to. And, um, she is really this awesome person. Tates and I got to meet her in person this year, last year in the fall And she is just one of the most amazing people that we have met because she really came from a very tragic talk about trauma situation. And she has turned into this person that just shines and dazzles and is trying to do such wonderful things and, you know, find justice for her mom. Um, And she's written this book about her experience. It has not been easy for her to work with law enforcement. Um, She's actually had much experience, like um, a lot of our cases in New Hampshire, Um, a lot of pushback, a lot of slow goings. So that's been really challenging for her. And just to, you know, see her go through that, I think has been for us has been like, how can we help? How can we, you know, advocate for her and give her some push and some, you know, support, but she really is amazing. She wrote a book about her experience and um, what she's been able to do for her mom's case. So that's a little bit about Lonnie and um, really it's about being able to find justice and Allison would really love to be able to locate her and um, bring her home. Yeah, absolutely. Well, it's, it's, it's so great to hear that her life ended up taking a change, you know, a very positive change, which is so fantastic to hear. Um, Still just so sad though. What's the name of her book? It's A Daughter's Journey and Story of Resilience. And it's available everywhere you can buy books, including Amazon. Oh, wonderful. Wonderful. We'll make sure and put a link to it in our show notes too. So everybody can check that out. Such a sad story though. Truly. We'll be right back after a quick word from our sponsors. And now back to our episode. Now, what happened with any investigation into Bud? Well, at the time of her disappearance, and then did it, they happen to kind of relook into it when Allison was taken to the police station? So when when Allison was taken to the police station, um, nothing happened then, as to my knowledge. But originally, Bud, they did try to interview him, but because he was deaf, I mean, he literally he has not still been officially interviewed because I guess the reason is because they haven't found an interpreter. So if I'm wrong on that, Shana, correct me. But still to this day, I don't think he's been properly interrogated. So I think the issue is, is that so Bud and and we've heard this from multiple people that Bud uses his um, his deafness as like an excuse. The issue I know when he was initially investigated was they didn't have an interpreter. And so he came in and it was like, no, no, I don't have an interpreter. So I think any time that they've approached him, he has been like, I don't understand or uh the, I'm not understanding the interpreter. I know that there has been attempts to interview him, but I don't know if there it has always been successful. Bud is a master manipulator. Um, he's still alive. Um, he doesn't live too far from the area. He moved. He he initially lived in the area for a long time. He recently moved further away. Uh, He actually belongs to Lonnie's Facebook group that Allison runs, which I think is just so crazy. Uh, Every once in a while, somebody will tag him in a post, which which he doesn't respond to, but he's there. Uh, I hope he sleeps with one eye open. Yeah, I was going to say, way to insert yourself. Right? Mm -hmm. Like, it's crazy. Uh, Allison has not Right. Allison does not have any conversation with him. She hasn't talked with him for years and years and years because I think it's a very traumatic, but um, she keeps a a tab on what he's doing. And uh, I'm sure that Bud probably lives with some of that guilt because there are people I think that have said things to him in years that, that are not so far away. Um, I know that, that, 
that deaf community, it they believe that there are answers within that deaf community. We've heard that from multiple people that, you know, maybe if we can get this more in the deaf community, there'll be some answers that maybe there are people that Bud was friends with that might know a little bit more information. Bud probably isn't the sharpest tool in the shed. So did he, did he slip up? Did he say something? We know that he had other girlfriends after Lonnie that, you know, he threatened and was abusive towards Mm -hmm. from stories that we've heard. Mm -hmm. So, you know, could something have been said that doesn't seem so important, but could be a piece to the missing puzzle. Um, So, you know, that's why we try to get flyers out. Um, We're hopefully going to be able to get a billboard out this year for Lonnie. So, you know, just, just some different ways to, you know, get that community maybe more aware of what is going on. Mm-hmm. Um, Allison is wonderful. She had, she has been able to get into those communities because she signs and she has relationships with some of those people. And I think people miss Lonnie. She was kind of a bright light to them and she was, um, uh, you know, a, a nice person. She was kind and people appreciated her. And I think they know who Bud's true colors and who he was. Mm-hmm. I, I don't know what information they've been able to totally get from him. Um, he's not necessarily a, uh, a, a named suspect. Wow. wonder if he's at least a person of interest. Certainly sounds yeah. like he needs to be. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's just crazy. And so the, the area that you're talking about is Hayfield Township, Pennsylvania, yeah. correct? Yeah. Does Allison still live around that area? No, she is in a different state, just a couple, you know, a couple states away, a couple, and that's a couple hours away. But um, she has friends in the area that keep her like in the loop on what's going on. So she's got a good tap on the town. That's good. What has she encountered with the law enforcement? You said that it sounded very similar to what people say they experience in New Hampshire. So we have to say we actually um, just met her, um, the state trooper that she's working with, Mm -hmm. and he was very kind to us and he was willing to help um, take on us if there was something with advocacy. We were just telling him about like flyers and billboards and he was he was very, very, you know, excited that we were doing those things. So, you know, we have nothing but positive things to say about that. So we appreciated that. Mm -hmm. Um, But the one thing that was kind of interesting to us. So like they rotate, they're kind of like on a rotating basis. So I think that's a frustration that, you know, your case doesn't necessarily stick with someone. And then I know one of the other things is, is there's a constant, I have so many cases I'll get to you when I have some time. And that's an excuse that's heard over and over again. And as we all know, when you have a family that you're working with, that's part of a murder case or a missing case or a violent crime case, they don't care about your other cases. Mm -hmm. They want answers for their case and they want them now, whether Mm -hmm. that case is 40 years old, 30 years old, two days old, like Right. There's no there there's no waiting. They don't care about those other cases. Mm-hmm. And if you don't have necessarily the empathy or the understanding for that, then the immediate tension that arises between the family and that law enforcement is just, I mean, it's hard to go back and fix that. Yeah. So I think for Allison that, you know, that that, that can that can hurt that can hurt a lot. I, you know, just like with our New Hampshire cases. And when they hear that, it's hard to, to stomach that, you know, my case isn't top of your priority list. It's been here for 30 years. What do you mean? So I, I think there's, there's a lot of that. And unfortunately, I don't think we teach enough empathy to investigative agencies into how to deal with that. And I also think we don't fund investigative agencies so that there are, you know, detectives that can handle these cases. Like, should we have detectives that are just working like 40 year old cases, 30 year old cases, 20 year old cases, you know, maybe that's something, um, you know, I definitely, we definitely don't have all the answers, but obviously they're um, running really thin and that makes families upset. So something has got to give because um, we're not really making any progress here and people are just hurting more. And for us as advocates, that that is not okay. 
Yeah, it's almost like that, that very common, like you understand there is a lack of resources, you know, and you understand there is only so much that one person can do with caseloads and things like that, but it doesn't, it doesn't make it okay. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It's such a consistent thing that's hurt is lack of resources, lack of this, lack of this, almost like a lack of support, which is just it's heartbreaking. It's heartbreaking yeah. for the families um, yeah. with these cases. But in um, Lonnie's other child, uh, Aaron, are they still involved with the case? Are they still around or? Yeah, Aaron has taken kind of a, um, a quieter a quieter piece in this. Um, Allison has a relationship with him, but um, Aaron had to grow up with Bud. So I think for him, it, there was a lot more trauma. Mm-hmm. Um, so while Allison is kind of the speaker for Lonnie and she represents Lonnie's case, I think for um, Aaron, he's just kind of quieter in this. He has done like a podcast where he was interviewed and he talked about his life growing up with Bud. And it just sounds like he was, you know, abused and really treated horribly by Bud. And I can't, you know, our hearts go out to him. You know, he was just a little boy when his mother disappeared and then to grow up and then to have your sister taken away from you. So Aaron and Allison have a relationship, but he is kind of out of the spotlight for this. Totally understandable. Was Aaron uh, younger or older than Allison? He was younger. I think Allison was five and Aaron, I think was two. I think Mm -hmm. there's about three years between them. So um, I'm sure, you know, he has almost no memory of, you know, growing up with Lonnie, which is just so heartbreaking. That is. Oh. Now, how old was Lonnie when she disappeared? 29. Yeah, I was going to say she was in her late 20s. Late 20s, okay. Mm-hmm. Late 20s, all right. And yeah, just to sort of reiterate that, so last seen January 7th, 1981, approximate height 5'5", five five, weighing about 140 pounds, sandy brown, blonde hair, gray eyes, and again, the Hayfield Township, Pennsylvania. Just reading that all from you guys is missing poster on her. Of course, we'll have that up in the visual, um, but just to get some of those stats out there. Thank you. Yeah. Now, has anybody able to find any sort of evidence or anything as to what might have happened to her? Or is it truly a cold case where nobody knows anything that might have happened and Bud holds all the answers? In Allison's book, she writes about um, a tip that she had received that Lonnie had been buried in an area uh, not far from where Bud had been working at the time. And when she wrote her book, she decided she kind of had this epiphany that she was just going to make everything public. She was so sick of everything being quiet and not being able to talk about it. So she was kind of like, I'm just gonna put it all out there. I'm going to say, I'm going to say what the police have told me. I'm going to say what I've heard through the years. I'm going to make this all public because being quiet has got me nowhere in all these years. She's been gone. She's been gone for so long. I'm going to do, uh, you know, she's been gone for 40 years at that point. And so she wrote about this in her book. And she also posted all of this on Facebook as it was going on. So she had gotten this tip that she had been buried in this area, not far from where um, Bud had worked at the time. And so she asked for people on her Facebook group to, uh, does anybody, does anybody have dogs? Does anybody have an excavator? Uh, is there someone who is an expert, uh, in this field and people came, it was like field of dreams, Mm -hmm. you know, if you build it, they will come. Mm -hmm. And so they did bring a, a dog and the dogs did hit in certain areas And it was kind of like, and I don't want to misspeak, but I believe the dogs hit like multiple times. Mm -hmm. So when they did excavate, the dogs were hitting by a tree and they dug like around the tree. And what the um, scientists told her is that sometimes when there are human remains buried, the roots, I have to visualize this, my hands, I'm sorry. The roots (laughs) like get the smell and it goes up. And so basically what they were kind of saying is she could have been buried there at one time and then moved. Oh, it was, it was picking up on her possible scent, but there could have been remains there. And then he moved them at one point, which I mean, could be a possibility because the dogs kept hitting in this one area of the tree. Um, And when they excavated, they couldn't find anything. 
Yeah, the uh, but, um, and that's one thing too about dogs. I mean, they don't, yeah. they don't, they don't miss either. I had mm-hmm. actually, it's interesting that you bring that up. I just recently heard about that too, like the roots of the tree actually being, um, being able to like touch like matter like that, and it actually flowing up through the tree. It it, it was intriguing to me that that was, um, that that was a possibility, but that that explanation would certainly um, make sense. But move to where, I wonder. That tip that she received, was that anonymous? I believe it was like from an ex-girlfriend of his, but it was like not directly from her. It was like from somebody who was friends with her or, you know, it was kind of like through the grapevine. But to her, it was she brought it to the police, the police didn't want to move on it. So she was, she was like, well, then I'm going to do something. And I think that some of her frustration with Ellie too is, you know, she has brought them some tips and they haven't done anything with them. Mm -hmm. So she did them herself. Yeah. I mean, if you're, if you're hearing that you don't have enough resources, if you're hearing that you don't, you know, oh, I have all these other cases, you're bringing new information and new tips and you're getting the response. Yeah. Oh, well, or I'm not going to do anything with it. If I were her, I would do the same exact thing. And I would be extremely frustrated that I was the person doing it because, Mm -hmm. I mean, there's, there's also certain protocols you need to follow in an investigation as well. It's, you know, what if they had actually found evidence too, like Mm -hmm. that you want to make sure that you're not hindering a possible, you know, investigation and conviction as well. That can be extremely frustrating. Yeah. Yeah. So that I think has been the biggest kind of tip that she's gotten. Um, And then other people have contacted her kind of to say like, your father said this to me or, you know, just kind of weird things he said over the years. Those types of of those things have kind of come in. Mm -hmm. So what's the next steps with the Light the Way and Lonnie Rogers case? Do you guys have anything planned um, in the future or is there anything coming down the road that we'd like to know about? Well, right now we're working on a billboard campaign. Um, look for that in the near future. We're going to be hopefully gathering some donations for a billboard in the area. And then Allison also runs a Facebook group for her mom, which is Justice for Lanin, um, that we encourage everyone to join. Allison's pretty active in it. Um, we post in it too to keep like the flyers going. So we'd, we'd love everyone to join that. She wants to keep her mom's name out there. We are also trying a new thing with a bunch of our cases this year where we're taking our billboards and shrinking them down to business cards this year Mm -hmm. um, for families to kind of spread in the area. Just a new way instead of flyers to kind of get people's faces out there. So that's something else that we're hoping to do this year. And then we're trying to bring Lonnie to as many media sources as we can because she just needs exposure because she's been gone for a long time. Yep, absolutely. Oh, you guys do such great work. And I love the idea that you have about shrinking the billboard down to like almost like the business card size. That's that's fantastic. Thank you. Yes, you guys do fantastic work. Oh, thank you. Um, you can find more information about Lanine on our website, www.lightthewaymissing.com. There's also a link to her Facebook page there that's run by her daughter, Allison. And we ask that anybody with any information to contact 814-332-6911, which is the Pennsylvania State Police, if you have any information. Wonderful. And we'll make sure and put all of that information as well as links to your website and that information for the Pennsylvania State Police too in our show notes as well, just to make sure and reiterate that. And obviously the visual of this will have pictures of um we'll pic- have pictures of her and of the missing poster as well. And yeah. So thank you guys so much. Is there anything else so that much. you want to share about her case or I don't think so, but we will keep you guys in the loop um, if anything comes up. And we so appreciate you spending some time to talk about Lonnie with us. Thank you so much. Thank you guys so much. Thank you. Always such a pleasure to have you guys. And um, and yeah, we'll keep on um, we'll keep on almost doing like a monthly or a bi monthly like coverage of the cases that you guys are covering as well. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you guys. Thank you all so much for listening to this episode of Invisible Tears. Make sure you subscribe to our podcast to hear all future episodes. Click into our link tree too in the episode description to find and follow us on all our social medias. And it also links to our website, invisible-tears.com, 
where you can keep current on any events that may be coming up, read more about Jane and the team, and read more about all the Connecticut River Valley unsolved cases. If you want to learn more about my wellness practice, Guided Path Wellness, head to guidedpathwellness.org. There you can read more about me and my certifications, more about the Reiki and coaching services I offer both in person and remote, and read all about my products for sale that I make through the practice. Feel free to utilize the contact us section on the website with any questions or utilize that free 15 minute consultation booking button if you have any questions about what might work for you. Evil may exist in this world, but we will not let it win. See you next episode.